Well, there have been a lot of good slash great comments about season two of Euphoria. Um, that's for sure. And this is a series that is you know, really fascinating. And I think <laughs> there's a, a segment, and I, as you probably already know this, it's, it's, it's typically older people where <laughs> they are scarred from watching this like, damn, is this what kids are going through now? But if we all thought about it, it's like, it's really not that much different than what we went through. It's just, I think this generation is just far more vocal and in touch with how they feel and with expressing that they're just not always gonna be happy all the time, right? And so, that is the part I really dig about it. Um, but nevertheless, um, you know, for you, I mean, since this is your generation, like how accurate would you say the show is in depicting about what this generation's life is actually like? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it it goes to everybody's experience and everybody's experience is different. Um, and I can't speak for my entire generation and I, thankfully haven't gone through the situations in which the characters in Euphoria are going through or have gone through. But I do know people that do go through those similar situations or uh, peers or just people on, on Twitter who talk about the show after an episode airs and, and they say how similar an experience was to their life or an encounter that they had in their life. That is what always brings me back to reality because mm. Um, sometimes I get lost in like, oh my God, this is too much. Like, this is not really happening. Like, this can't happen. This is entertainment. This is too high end. Um, but you have to really have empathy for the people that are saying that this stuff is true. And then you have to look at our creator, director, director, um, creator, director, writer, um, <laughs> Sam Levinson. Um, he's had a lot of experiences that Rue is going through. So um, you just, again, have to have empathy. And, and I, I thank my lucky stars that those experiences haven't been mine, but I'm glad to be a part of a show and proud to be a part of a show that depicts what the real world is and tries to bridge the disconnect between the older generations and the generation now. And, and trying to let people know that, yeah, there it's not always happy-go-lucky. It's not always teenagers on their phone. We go through real stuff too. I know people have um, branded this generation, you know, Generation Z. I prefer to call y'all the what we not gonna do generation because <laughs> the one thing that I am in awe of that I admire, um, I admire many things, but I'll say the one thing that really strikes me about this generation is that you all have such a clear cut idea of boundaries that previous generations did not really have. What, you know, what's your, your guess or your thoughts about why this generation seems to be, um, seems to have so much agency? Oh, um, I mean, I think we have so much agency because we know what's at stake. Um, I think a lot of people tend to say um, Gen Z is the future, but we are the present and we are making decisions now and we are trying to make a change now so the future generations don't have to go through what we are going through right now. And I think Gen Z... Um, was forced to grow up a lot faster than a lot of different or a lot of other generations due to everything that we have seen in the last couple of years. But um, we take that with pride and, and, and responsibility. And we know that, yes, even though we are going to be the change makers one day, the laws, the lawmakers one day, we are going to be making the critical decisions in our world to make it a better place. Um, we know that we are not perfect and we're gonna make mistakes and that we are kids and we have to give ourselves grace, but we do not take any BS. And, and we are very clear about what we want to see in the world. and. Uh, whether that's in politics or in media or in our households or our schools, we have this clear idea of what equality and equity is and in intersecting that. Um, so I'm proud to be a, a, a part of a generation that is so smart and, and is so engaged and, and finds it so important um, to really try to make a change in any way possible. Yeah, I mean, I thought about it one day um, from this perspective. The first presidential election I voted in was was Bill Clinton. 
1996. And um, for a lot of people in this generation, their first presidential race was 2016, mm -hmm. some even 2020. So I can't imagine how traumatic that experience in itself would be because of, as you, again, you pointed out the stakes. I mean, the stakes for uh, the black community are always high. They're always, it seems to be, I, I said this the other day, I'm so tired of going to the voting booth with life or death being on the ballot, right? And so that that is just not a, a comfortable feeling, but as high stakes as it was in 1996, it was nothing compared to what it is now. So I, a, a part of me just wonders like how much that has shaped what your generation is absorbing in terms of trauma on top of a pandemic, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. I, I, I think, again, we were forced to grow up a lot faster due to our socioeconomical climate and, and politics and just the world around us. And in the height of a pandemic, we were um, on the front lines fighting for our lives and fighting for our brothers and sisters. And, and I think in New York City, there is a big clock counting down the days we have left on earth there's a lot of things that we we are going through that we see that we witness um that it, it's hard to digest and and it is traumatic but again i i think it's about taking the approach of trying to make a change now so it won't be as hard for our future children or our nieces and nephews or our cousins or just the global community. It's important to, even though the world feels as though it's very dark, we try to be the light in the darkness, or at least I try to be the light in the mm -hmm. darkness. And I mean, I can't say that every day is is easy, I, I, especially in the, the height of the pandemic and in 2020 and all the George Floyd protests were going on. I, I found myself just feeling helpless and, and was so frustrated that I couldn't do anything. And I found myself in my car just bawling my eyes out because I couldn't go anywhere because it was unsafe to go places. I couldn't go out to protest at the time because we didn't know if they were safe or not. It, it, it was a lot of emotion and a lot of unpacking that I still feel like we need to continue to do. Um, but I think we are trying to make the baby steps to do so and heal um, and, and again, try to make the world a better place. Now you're in your freshman year at, at USC. I can't imagine what it's like going to college in the midst of a pandemic and you already have a very busy um, acting career. Uh, have you declared a major? Yes, so I am okay. in the School of Dramatic Arts right now. Okay. I assume as such, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Of African American studies, but I think I might switch my major in my sophomore year um, to the School of Cinematic Arts just to learn about more uh, editing and cinematography and film production. I think it, it's it would be more useful for me, um, even though the the School of Dramatic Arts program is is fantastic and the theater classes are great. Um, I think it'll be more useful for me to have more knowledge under my belt about the entire business rather than continue to just learn about the acting side of things. Um, so I'm excited to dive into that. So what is the, the social aspect of being a freshman at USC like, especially for somebody who has such a robust acting career as you do? Yes, I mean, it's been amazing. It's been so much fun. I am so grateful to be able to attend college and, and get the college experience um, and, and get that social aspect that I feel like I was missing out on because since 2018, I think I've been pulled in so many different directions and always working and always traveling. So I have like my friends back at home and a few friends in LA, but I didn't have a, a, a big group of friends to where I was like, let's go hang out or let's go bowling or let's go do this. And now I have that. So that makes me extremely happy. But the first couple of weeks at school were a little odd because of course people love euphoria, people know my work. So mm -hmm. I'd be outside standing in, in, in our little USC village or outside of Trader Joe's. And it would just, it would be swarms of, of young people coming up and being like, oh my God, Gio, oh my God, Storm. Warm. Oh my God, a wrinkle in time, which I find very cool. Um, but I did have to find a balance of like, 
okay, I'm at school, I'm here to, I feel like I'm normal and regular, but I'm, I'm here to be normal and regular and get my education and hang out with my friends and do like teenage cool things. Um, so I had to kind of decipher the way I was going to operate with people at school. So instead of people asking me, for pictures, I, 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 in the most polite way, I say, well, let's have a conversation instead. Like, what's your name? What's your major? What year are you um, here at USC? Instead of taking a picture and, and making it feel like um, less of a normal experience for myself. And I know people are excited. I know people like my work, but I try to continue to still be as nice as possible and be polite as possible and really get to know a person and, and, and have a conversation rather than a picture and you walk away and that's it. Well, I, I'm just assuming at USC that you're probably not the only celebrity or actor that's going to college there. Is right. that I mean, I'm guessing we have a, we have a few students that um, that are in the business or the parent or their parents are in the business. Right. So it's not an odd thing, but I think when new people get to campus and especially being a part of a show um, like Euphoria that is so big and people are so excited about, I think that's what motivated people's um I guess, again, excitement to to want to have a conversation or want to take a picture. Um, speaking of euphoria, I know that Drake is an executive producer. And um, at least I, I read that he did a table read with you guys. What was that like? We did. It was so odd. So we had, um, we shoot on the lot in LA and um, I was told we were having our season two um table reads right before we went into lockdown and I pull up my mom drops me off and I just see a whole bunch of like just black cars and black escalades and I'm like okay like who's here something's going on and then next thing you know it's Drake and his homies and um, his business partner Future the Prince and I thought it was really cool because I'm a Drake fan outside of him being a producer on the show so I was kind of geeking out on the inside but played it cool as a cucumber okay on that's how you gotta do yeah. <laughs> um, and I was, I thought he was just like coming by to say hi, but he literally sat through our, I think two and a half, three hour table read, really engaged. He never stepped out. Of course we had breaks and he bought everybody John and Vinny's and, and pizza and stuff and ate with us. So that was really cool. But you would think like he's Drake. He's a businessman. He is one of the most known people in the world. He would be on his phone. He would need to be taking phone calls. He would need to be stepping out, but he didn't do any of that. And I was like, that's super duper cool. And, and, and cool to see somebody so invested in something that they put their name on because people can put their name on something and not show up, just put it, put a uh, their name on on a project for vanity purposes as a producer, but he seems to be really engaged and, and, and a fan of the show. So that helps as well. 